that is extremely heterogeneous across. So the next question, what changes do you see happening in the research in research in the next five to 10 years? I think a key question is where in research, because we know that it's extremely heterogeneous across the globe. What I can see for ha foresee happening in the global south is that we're in a unique position because open science will develop not on top of a developed research culture or developed research system, but rather in tandem with developing research infrastructure. And so there are two things that can happen. One, if they're able to go in concert, we will see a new type of research system that we've never seen before, which actually prioritizes research impact and not impact factor, but actual research impact, what research is intended to do. Otherwise, what we're going to see is simply a repetition and they're headed and the global South will be headed for the same replicability issues and crises that we've seen earlier, maybe almost a decade ago. So those are the two sort of scenarios I can see happening in the global South. Wonderful. Well, uh, hello everyone. Um, and now for something completely different. So Nadia and I are going to be taking over the reins and give Alex a well-deserved rest. Um, so I guess we can start by inviting our panelists to um, to give their take on that question. And um, if you could try to keep to um, short, sweet answers and we try and get as many viewpoints as possible in the limited time that we have. So just to remind everybody that the question was, what changes do you see happening in research in the next five to 10 years? Um, let's hear from our speaker from earlier today, from Malvika. Would you care to give your perspective on that, Malvika? Yeah, um, in five to 10 years, down the line, I wish we don't have open source, open science conference because that's just what science should look like. I'm really uh, going back to Moin's talk about we should stop talking about diversity. I think we should stop talking about open science and do the job. We have so much to learn. There are so much uh, recommendations that, that were made today by the speakers who were here, but there's so much out there. So I wish in five years time, I'm not an open source specialist anymore. Wonderful. Uh, I can agree. I hope to be obsolete in the future, uh, which is not what you would normally hear from somebody who's trying to make a career in, in open research, but it's definitely a, a good objective to have to make these things more ubiquitous. Um, I guess, uh, Moin, maybe you could um, to give us give us some insight in what you think in the five to ten years, because there is a sort of arc of progress and you've been sort of uh, quite a vocal uh, contributor to that conversation. Yeah, OK, I have to choose one because I'm supposed to be brief here, right? So OK, so one thing that I think is going to happen is quite different from what I was talking about, and a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I think it's true, is that we will no longer be relying on impact factors um, for judging the quality of journals. I, I absolutely think impact factors are on their way out. Um, librarians will be very clear about this. Publishers will not say it officially, but they'll say it behind the scenes that they agree that this is the case. Um, we know from every empirical demonstration that I know of, either you see a negative correlation or no correlation between impact factor and quality of the research reported in the papers. And I think that's being increasingly recognized. And why that's really relevant to open science is if we stop using impact factors to judge where we need to be publishing our work, it really opens the doors to being able to prioritize um, journals that are really featuring um, and, and emphasizing rigorous science over um, prestige. Not to say the prestige is going to be gone completely, I'm not that naive, um, but at least impact factor is one thing that we can be getting rid of that would really help. And I think it's going to happen. I have a bet with somebody that'll be gone in five years that was made two years ago. I have three years to go. Um, um, that might be a little ambitious, but yeah, I think that's it's on the horizon. Great, I'm loving these responses, uh, everybody. Uh, Leslie, perhaps you could round us off because of course your, uh, your talk was talking about a lot of what you've experienced over the years in as there's been sort of fights and battles and constant firefighting in this in discussion. So I wonder whether you could contribute to sort of what we could learn um, from from your lived experience as well as the research that you've done in this area. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend all the 
uh, young researchers who put this panel together, this event. I, I marvel at your enthusiasm and your optimism, and I encourage that. And looking back, you know, when I was your age, I was also very optimistic. Uh, I'm slightly more cynical now, but hopefully in a in a in a justifiable way. So even back when I was a graduate student in the dark ages, we were debating about impact factor, and some of us like you know also predicted the demise of the impact factor 25 years ago. And yesterday I was reading about this news about the University of Liverpool where they have uh, sacked 47 researchers based on their rankings and their uh, impact factors. And so I start out my talk about impact, you know, university rankings and so forth. The metrics name may change, but they are there. There are these governing instruments that are controlled by these very powerful entities that run our universities. So when, when I look at those hiring criteria and all those things that you spoke about, Elizabeth, on the one hand, I, I say, OK, good idea. On the other hand, I, I know the power that be uh, are vested elsewhere. And 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 I think we could we could have those power back, but it is a different set of strategies we need to take. I not not convincing our senior researchers to to do those kind of things because they're set in a way uh, they're not going to change and there's no time for them to change, to be quite honest. You guys are the change. Uh, but you need to think also differently about taking control of those infrastructures that I was talking about. Wonderful. So I have no predictions because every prediction <laughs> I made was wrong. So. <laughs> right, okay. So um, I think you've actually keyed up uh, Nadia. So I understand that we want to get everybody to speak, but let's move on for for different content as well as different viewpoints. So Nadia, this actually leads nicely into the question that you've um, collated throughout the day. Yeah, it does. Um, although I was so excited to hear Moyne say impact factors are going to be out in the next five years and then for Leslie to follow that up with, I've been waiting 25 years. <laughs> I, I feel like more. if I keep saying it, maybe it'll become true. That's why. <laughs> I know, now I feel really dejected again. But I think, yes, we should keep saying it and so hopefully it will be true. Um, and so, but really it's to follow on from how Leslie finished with talking about um, what we do next. And as early career researchers, we find this conference, for example, um, really does demonstrate how tuned we are to our environment and wanting to make change and wanting to do things for the positive. Um, and we do have a bit of a, I suppose, a dichotomy. We often talk about early re career researchers, senior academics, and we're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And of course, we do need to work together. Um, but I guess one of the major themes today has been inclusivity. And so really what I would like to ask is to maybe to our more junior members of the panel first, so to Elizabeth and to Lonnie, um, you know, how do you, how do you think or what do you think senior academics could be doing to improve our research culture and research outputs, including exclusivity, inclusivity, um, especially when we're considering sort of the right to, uh, to knowledge making and sharing. Um, and so I'll put that to Elizabeth first and then we'll see Lonnie what your thoughts are and then we can go to maybe some of the more senior members of our panel. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if I can come back to uh, the comment that was made by Leslie as well, I think it's 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 interesting and I've heard somebody say uh, previously that science progresses one funeral at a time, which is a bit of a harsh comment as well. Um, but but I, I'd actually like to believe that's not true. I'd like to believe that we're in an academic environment, so it's all about learning. So why couldn't we learn about how uh, our culture is changing? I think if we try to study new things, then we would also be able to learn new things. And I think that's actually a way um, that seniors can help us. So um, they can sort of um, lay the foundation for us so give us the time to invest uh, acknowledge that it takes time to learn new skills and have a little patience with us um, and and let us struggle a bit so that we have the time and then in the end we can show them um, that this is really for the better and that they can also learn from us and that we can bring the change also to them 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Lonnie, have you got anything to add? Yeah, uh, some things to add. Uh, also, coming back to the comment from Leslie initially, and then diving into this, um, I, I can talk about a personal experience to, to start and like finish on that experience uh, and the uh, things that Leslie mentioned. I went to a small conference a while back that was about how to write for grant applications. And this person that got this amazing grant when she was 30, and it's a grant they usually get when you're 45 or something. And she said, oh yeah, I think the fact that I was a TV host presenting science really made a change into my application. That's probably why I got it, because I was good at explaining science. And so my only question to that was, that, okay, now you're part of the community is deciding who's getting a grant, right? What do you look at? Do you look at having a nature baby? Because she, she said that she had one, but it was luck. So do you look at this or do you just look at how this person is actually trying to change the way things are? And she said, of course, nature papers matter. And and that was that was that was extremely sad because what what was the takeaway from this is that well she, she got the grant because her CV was different, but she doesn't pay any attention to that anymore. And I think that's the way that uh, senior researchers could actually help us now. It's remembering that there's lots of things that make a good researcher and it's not necessarily publications or big impact factor. It will always matter to some of them. But I think if we want to move forward, uh, like what we need is not just hiring committees to change their requirements or criteria, it's also deep social change. If we want researchers to not care about the career anymore, they shouldn't be worried about it. That's the first thing that should happen. I was asked here if I wanted to stay in Sweden when I was in Sweden uh, to, I could get a position if I find my own funding. And I was like, no, that's not giving me a position that's that's basically telling me that I need to find my own salary. I'm not going to do that. You want me, you pay me. You don't pay me, I don't stay. Over and out. And the fact that no senior researcher backed this up was sad. It's like, I don't think this is a valuable system. Like No other worker in the world would accept this except us. So I think, I think we need a deep social change in like how positions are funded and how funding money is given. I know there's experiments in Australia about random allocations of money that seem to work very, very well. Um, why not do that? I mean, and never have to worry about your own salary. I think that's the one thing that we should really tend to focus on if we want to get rid of impact factor and H index and citations and all of these stupid metrics, because they will just be replaced by new things, like old metrics now. I mentioned them in my talk, but like now it's the one thing that people look at during hiring committees as well. Like, oh, is your papers really mentioned on Twitter? Well, what does it matter? Like, if the paper is good, do you really care? Like, you know, there's there's always be gonna be, gonna be measures in the end, so. I guess that's. Thank you, Lonnie. I think it's really useful to hear to hear your experiences. Those parts of it, of course, are quite disappointing. Um, and you definitely spoke to some of the things that Moin was saying about being early career researchers and not yet being, I suppose, institutionalised or um, cultural being culturally dependent or of of the system. And we can we can be more disruptive and consider what we want to what we want our future and the infrastructure around us to be. So there's a there's a, Maddie's typed into the chat um, a bit of her her response uh, to this. Um, so tech issues um, are preventing her from joining us. But I hope to see she says I hope to see a lot more collaboration, particularly in moving away from disciplinary silos. We have so much to learn from other disciplines and vice versa. And I'd like to see research become more open beyond psychology specific open science tools. For example, over the past 12 months, we've been forced into a much more collaborative, open, accessible way of working due to COVID. I've made connections with people from countries and time zones that I've never have been able to, to without the wave of online working. I think the impact of this will trickle through for the year, for years. This will be particularly relevant as higher education continues to push a global citizenship agenda, which I see as being really positive for research possibilities. And so just to, I suppose, to end and to bookmark that, Leslie, do you have any comments on that part? Because I think that speaks to sort of the future research. I don't have specific response to this previous comment, but I've been going back again about and again, the bigger changes in terms of the, the bigger socio-political context. When, when my professors were hired in the 60s, half of my professors that I know were hired over the telephone. Uh, today, uh, the job application I'm setting up on job you know, application committees, last one we have 150 people apply for one job, one guy with two PhD, another guy had three PhDs. Um, and for one job, and then of course, uh, you can multiply that. So what we have 
is a very different employment situation in different generations. And we have created these very scarce position, you know, that make everybody compete for it, th jumping through all kinds of hoops that are impossible. So we created these really impossible metrics and standards and so forth as a way to control the labor market, let's face it. And so, uh, so previous generations, people don't have to face these same kind of things, you know, and they now sit in judging of the new generation of researchers. So I often turn to my colleague and say, well, we'll never get a job if we were in the same market today. We don't have the same kind of publication when we were, you know, being hired and, and so forth. Why are we imposing these impossible things on new scholars when we didn't have to go through them ourselves, right? That's extremely unfair, but that's number one. The number two is that the other reality is the scarcity of the job market. I was reading a Royal Society report from 2010 that basically says 0.04% of PhD becomes permanent professor. Another, in another half a percent, they become permanent researchers in the institution, right? But we here are telling graduate students, oh, if you only do X, Y, Z, you're going to get a great job in this kind of institution. Those are myths that we string student along. And then we call them early career researchers. That's basically another labor pool with which we can exploit more students for the longer term, in addition to postdoc, which is another exploitative categories of labor. So, sorry being so cynical. I'm saying that a lot of these things are being made up by agency outside to run public institutions that we often fall in line with because of these promises uh, for the few, right? So, so we need to question these system, uh, who's running them, and to say, well, we don't want to subject ourselves to these system. Our labors are far more valuable for yourself and for each other. You can do much better for societies working in different capacity, not simply as a tenure professors or whatnot, uh, that you can do research, you can do science in other way that could be contribution to society as well, right? So I'm just throwing that in to expand our conversation about those kind of confines we find ourselves in. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, uh, you, we definitely could go off topic and talk about exploitation and academia <laughs> to, to the cows come home because um, many of us obviously feel that we are in positions that are, are not valued high enough um, and we want to have you know we we came to academia did our doing our PhDs or, or our postdoctoral researchers and that's because we want to have a positive influence or impact on society but maybe we are not in the best place to do that um, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to remain in academia and and try and shape it for the better as well um, and it's us that who are here today perhaps you feel that we may have the greatest agency to do that or at least we're motivated in that way at the moment but anyway i will um, not hold the limelight anymore and i'll um, hand over to sam for, a, for another question uh wonderful um well i i guess that what i'm interested in is the potential unintended consequences of what we're doing and and thinking back to the answers before there was lots of um positive outcomes but i've seen for example plan s potentially disadvantage the publication um, infrastructure in south america and actually leslie stole my thunder here because i was going to bring up the case of the university of liverpool where we have um a <laughs> there is a, a, there is a university that has uh, it's part of the uk reproducibility network and it's also um hiring uh, with grant funding from the wellcome trust uh, a position for somebody to take care of metrics in hiring and promotion but they're also laying off 47 staff based on a metric system. So this is open washing and, uh, and it's not great and it undermines what we're doing. So I wondered whether the panel could offer sort of potential unintended consequences that we need to be vigilant of and, and how to, to avoid them becoming a, an issue. And one person who I'd probably like to hear from it actually is Malvika 
Um, the reason being is because with the Turing, they 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 have really built up an infrastructure to cultivate open research in a very open and inclusive environment. So they must have considered these potential pitfalls. And I guess, Malvik, if perhaps you could offer an insight or what you know and stand from inside Turing. I, I might not be in the best position to speak for Turing, but I can definitely speak in terms of um, what you call open washing is the first time I've heard, and I think it uh, it is probably true. In terms of uh, consequences, I think the problem is that the policies are written by just few few number of people who are making decisions behind the closed door. Nobody has an opinion or thoughts to express before they are out in public and a policy already. So. I think we need to build a better system where these policies don't get out before more people have looked into it and assess the consequences that it can have on them because these people who are getting affected by changes are not people who are sitting and making decision inside. Um, some of the examples that actually Elizabeth gave and the talk had around, you know, credit system. Um, there are quite a lot of initiators within the UK, but also outside, which uh, Dora is trying to promote quite a lot, and it has not been re very, very successful, right? Like signing Dora does not really eliminate the the problem of uh, people people's bias that's integrated into the system that you know you need to have high impact factor. Let's not go there. We've already touched that part. That it's a really difficult place to change. But coming back to how do we achieve? open research in Turing, or let me just say in the Turing way, it's an open project, meaning that not just Turing researcher, but researcher outside Turing are also able to contribute. What does what that allows me to do is to show the evidence more faster, right? If I engage with Turing researchers only, I might not be able to engage 250 researchers who are contributing in the project. I get to do that because people from all around the world are able to contribute to my project. And that builds uh, evidence for me to show that open research work, open infrastructure work, you know, acknowledgement fairly works. Everything that we are trying to do works. So what's your excuse? So, but on the top of that, just because we have these contributors working with us very openly, other projects have started to build upon the Turing way. And that should be the dream, right? That my research should be open so someone can build on that. My research shouldn't be unique. My research should be basis of someone else's work. And I think, we as an open source community and open source project can think in this direction because that's our personal motivation. But for an institute that has been there for forever, um, not talking about Turing, it's quite new, but for, for older research institutes, it's a really difficult change to make. I also want to just quickly come back to the fact that, you know, we are talking about our ECRs and there are, you know, uh, senior researchers. We, we are all in this together. We are all activists. We are all trying to make the same change. I don't think we are against each other. We just have different experiences. We have different priorities at a given time. We finished our PhD. We are not stressed anymore, so we move on to something else that we are stressed about. But you're right. I think we need to have these dialogues a lot more. So we align our thoughts and align what we can do that, that is actually mutually beneficial. It's not exact answer, but it's somewhat out there. <laughs> Thank you, Malik. That was a really nice, uh, comprehensive answer there. And um, I was going to throw this over to Leslie, but I'm still recovering from the the previous downers that he's put us on. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask Moin if he could just interject and and maybe just pass a comment on the, these sort of unintended uh, consequences. I mean, one of them was you know prioritizing a certain type of diversity, but you you're you're hoping to extend that definition out to not only the culture, but our practice as well. So you must have come into contact with these other unintended focus on, on a specific area at the cost of others. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the issue, the way to think about it, at least from my perspective, and this echoes what people have been, have been saying all day, is we need to think about the fact that we're conducting science, conducting research within a system. Right, we're not. It's not just individual practices that we engage in, but it's a system. So if, if we 
if we just change specific practices that we're engaging in, but don't do anything with the system, there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences, right? You saw this in a debate about moving, you know, redefining statistical significance from 0.05 to 0.005 or, or, you know, things of that nature or some that pre-registration, some aspects of pre-registration could just reproduce some of the expectations of always being correct and everything like that. Those kinds of practices don't change the system, right? It's how we actually um, conduct, incentivize, and, and ensure inclusivity inclusivity um, within our science. That's true in terms of open science in general, but then also in terms of diversity. Again, this is a point that was made by Leslie and Sandy and Malvika and others that um, the open science movement, which I do think is a movement, if it doesn't actually take seriously the structural constraints of access and opportunity and inclusivity, it's just going to reproduce those existing power inequalities. Right? If it's not taking that system's perspective, it's going to be reproduced. And so you really need to be looking at that level of things. And I think that's critical. And certainly for looking at um, diversity and moving away from the deviance, pers cultural deviance perspective and thinking about, OK, how do I think about the diversity in front of me and what are the different perspectives that are available? Um, briefly, I did want to comment on the senior, what senior academics could do, and I'll keep it brief. Um, it's important that we recognize that on the road to becoming a senior academic for ECR to mid-career, mid-career exists too, I put myself in that category, that you accrue a lot of academic capital and academic power. And it's up to the senior, once you're at senior status, you have to think about what are you going to do with that capital? What are you going to do with that power? Are you going to use that power to attain more power, right? to consolidate and get more of it? Or can you use some of that power to ensure that there's greater access and inclusivity for those coming up behind you? And that's a choice that every senior academic has to face. And um, we know what choice most of them make, <laughs> right? And so I think it's really important to for senior folks to be actively speaking out on these issues and being a role model and, and supportive of open science, of diversity, of access. And, you know, that's something that I've been trying to do as much as possible. And I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from folks thanking me for saying, you know, it's really important that somebody who has made it in the system is able to really advocate for others. And I think that's more can be doing that, but most are choosing not to. So I think it's just important for senior academics to reflect on that and think about how are you using your power? Wonderful. That could be a really nice note to end on, uh, Alex. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I know that we we scheduled to I think stop at at five past for you to to, to wrap up. Uh, I will just quickly say that um, Daniel in the Q and A has put a link to a um, open letter that you can sign in support of this sort of kickback against the, the the actions of the University of Liverpool. So if anybody wants to uh, do that, then you can do so by find, looking in the Q and A. Uh, so, Alex, I guess I'll pass the reins over to you. Yeah, thank Alex, you. Sorry, I wonder if I can jump in and share a couple of links. Uh, I, I just want to highlight that, you know, I know I I kind of give you some downers, but the reason is, again, as, as uh, you know, uh, some of you mentioned, someone has to speak out, and I, I see myself's position as speaking out. And I see myself in the university as making spaces for young scholars. So this knowledge equity lab that I mentioned earlier in my school is my way of making sure that there are spaces for other voices within the academy. So so yes, there, there's there are people who, who are doing things. And these links that I share are alternative ways of building infrastructures. And there are lots and lots of people taking part in it. So our next step is to convince the funder to fund these open infrastructures that allow different communities to build the kind of system that they want and not be stuck in the journal system uh, that we are so stuck with, right? So there are lots of things positive going on. I just don't want to leave with the idea that this guy is just a downer, but there are lots of positive things going on. So I just want to make sure that, <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much, uh, Leslie. Like that, that's a really good uh, note to end on as well. So Marion's just posted the uh, the links that you've shared in the Q and A. Um, we've had a few uh, comments about how it would have been nice to to have the Q and A be a bit more interactive. And I know that Microsoft Teams live events doesn't really allow that. So we will keep that in mind for the for the future to try and try and um, uh, 
sure that we can have um, a better conversation throughout the day because it was lovely to to hear everyone's perspective at the end. But I would like if that was not just a 20 minute bit at the end. Um, so let me just see if I can share my last slide. Um, yeah. Mm. Right, so so just wanted to um, just end by thanking everyone from the uh, Riot Science Club and thanking Trevor for the audiovisual support uh, for today. We couldn't have done anything without you. Um, the conference was truly a dream come true for me and it was wonderful to have this uh, great lineup of speakers. Uh, and I really hope that everyone has enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, so before everyone heads off, um, Olivia has posted a link to a feedback form in the um, in the Q&A box. So I'd really appreciate it if you could um, give us some open and honest feedback in the in the um, interest of openness and transparency, uh, because we are kind of doing this in our in our free time on top of our jobs and our PhDs. So um, we're always looking to do better and um, to learn from our experiences. So if you have any suggestions, do do pop them in there. Um, so yeah, all the recordings from the conference will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube uh, channel, hopefully in the near future. And we'll also uh, find a way to share the Q&A uh, list as well. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the speakers. It, it was wonderful to have your contributions today. Uh, Alex, Alex, before you yeah. before you finish, uh, yeah. last year, Marion um, gate crashed the ending to, to say a few words. And it's uh, my turn this year. Um, so if I can just steal people's uh, last few minutes, uh, please. So it, it is usually customary for an organiser of the event to be given a gift uh, as a way of thank you and for someone on the team to say a few words to highlight the work that this person has done. Um, a gift is on its way to you, to you now. Um, and I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to say a few quick words. I do hope I'm not uh, imposing or gay crushing. So last year I led a, an organising team to deliver the King's Open Research Conference and the aim was to highlight the perverse incentives that undermine the credibility of our research and, and the damage uh, to the quality of life that it can do on the researchers mm -hmm. as they relentlessly chase papers and, and grants. It was hugely successful and I close by saying that we needed to continue the conversation to everyone outside the conference as well. Um, but I knew that that more work could be done. And I often say this, as you know, that the, the O in the Riots Club is, is perhaps the most important part of who we are, uh, openness. And only through collective effort, as Maddie said, can we deal with the, the challenges ahead with fairness and opportunity being our watchwords. Um, so it was really heartwarming and affirming to find that you wanted to extend this conversation and include uh, those ideas and people in underrepresented corners of the scientific community here today. Um, and I've watched you over the past few months uh, like, a, like a bat out of hell, try to coordinate and, co uh, and co-organise uh, the rights team and our wonderful speakers today without losing any nerve or focus on your aim. So um, I think it's fair to say that in the, in the three years the Riots Club has been going, we've had many highlights and, and this one is definitely top of the list. So without sounding conceited, I really would have never thought that a few disgruntled ECRs in the basement of the SGDP could have uh, contributed to the positive change in such a significant way. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you personally uh, for making this happen. And I guess in true Zoom MS Teams style, could I ask that everybody in the producers just unmute and give a, a round of applause for for Alex and everybody else that has that has contributed today. So thank How's you that? and uh, thank you, Alex. And uh, I'll give you the final word. And so it's not just me that uh, has the last word. <laughs> That's all right. Thank thank you so much, Sam, for your uh, for your kind words. I don't really know what to say. I'll I'll try to keep it very short so I don't cry in front of the 71 people that are still left in the call. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll hopefully I'll hopefully uh, stay in touch and and kind of collaborate in the future. That'll be that'll be wonderful. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wonderful. <laughs>